Hello, welcome to All Things Agave with a spotlight on tequila, sponsored by Penta Tequila. I am Ilona Thompson with Palette Exposure. My guests today are Steve Reynolds and Adam Stembler. Steve, of course, is known by his namesake brand, Reynolds Family Winery in beautiful Napa Valley, but he's also a distiller. Adam Stembler is partner in Farm League Restaurant Group. I know he looks pretty young, folks, but don't be fooled. This gentleman has 27 years of experience in the restaurant space, and he's only 40. We're going to need to know more, Adam. Welcome both. Thanks, Alona. We're here to talk tequila. As my spirit animal, I cannot learn fast enough and more in volume of what is there to know about tequila. So let's just start with the fact that tequila is obviously a very popular category, but what's so special about it? Why tequila? Tequila is a bit of an enigma, um, especially within the bar community uh, for a number of different reasons. But I think oftentimes we as bartenders gravitate towards things that are a little um, weird or different or don't classically fit into a box. And as a general rule with an overwhelming majority of spirits, and this actually pertains to you know the beer and wine category as well, but almost everything starts off as some kind of fruit ferment or some kind of grain ferment. And you can kind of classically place an overwhelming majority of the distillates that we drink you know, on a daily or weekly basis within those two categories. But agaves don't neatly fit into either. You know, they have some some fruit characteristics. They have some grain characteristics. You know, the starches and agave plants aren't readily available for fermentation. So you have to, you know, you have to have a uh, the, the hand of the maker involved in that process. And so I think by virtue of the fact that it doesn't neatly fit into either category, it has always been something that is a bit of, uh, has some, some serious interest by the fact that it's just categorically different than an overwhelming majority of the things that we have historically uh, made distillates out of. So there's that. Um, I think an overwhelming majority of people that drink agave distillates on a regular basis will note that the feeling is a little bit different. Like I feel different when I drink tequila and mezcal than I do when I drink scotch. And like, uh, you know, in terms of like palate, I enjoy both a lot, but I, I would be lying if I said I feel as good both while I'm drinking and after I'm drinking uh, as I do with agave spirits than you know, the comparison to other things. So I think a lot of us that, you know, for lack of a better term, drink professionally and you know, want to be very involved in the process of not just, hey, I'm, I'm obviously you know, drinking to ascertain a certain feeling, but I'm also enjoying what I'm consuming in the process, um, agave spirits are just different. And it's, it's really hard to put your thumb on why they're so different and why they're so special. But there's something uniquely different about not only the effects and the feeling of when you're drinking a, a very fine tequila or a mezcal, but also the way you feel the next day. Um, honestly, like I know a lot of reformed whiskey drinkers who were, you know, scotch enthusiasts their entire life. And then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, they're in their fifties now and, and they flat out say, they're like, I can't drink whiskey anymore. Like it wrecks me the next day, but I can still drink tequila and, and feel mostly good or better than I otherwise would. So I think that compiled with how important agaves were to the indigenous people of Mexico before the Spaniards arrived and their rich traditions of worshiping these plants, creating deities that represent these plants. You know, in traditional uh, indigenous Mexican culture before the Spaniards arrived, I mean, they created a, a goddess to represent these plants because of how important they were. And that same goddess was synonymous with fertility and life. So you have a group of people that created the concept of a deity around life, fertility, and agaves. So it's kind of, uh, it's pretty amazing that those, those three things are kind of encompassed into one deity and that goddess's name is Mayuel. Um, 
So I think there's always just been a, a an, an enigma and a, and a curiosity that kind of surrounds the spirit for all of those reasons. And, you know, I grew up in San Diego, California, and we moved around a lot because we didn't have you know, a ton of money. And uh, there were various points in my childhood where I lived in relative proximity of the border. And we always, you know, as a family would go south of the border to Tijuana, you know, once a month or X amount of time. So the cultural components of tequila have always been near and dear to my heart uh, as someone that grew up in San Diego, which, you know, has a very, very, very large Hispanic uh, population. So for all of those different reason, reasons, I kind of slowly but surely got lured and, and sucked into that space. And I make absolutely no apologies about saying that, you know, if I have my choice nine times out of 10, I'm going to drink an agave spirit. And that's not to say that other spirits aren't amazing, but if I have my way, nine times out of 10, I'm drinking tequila or mezcal. Yeah, done. That's, Call it that's a day. such a big deal, Adam. First of all, I just want to highlight a couple of things. For those of us that are tequila fans, uh, we know those effects that you just described a lot. They're off more accurately. So there's a lot of conversations and there's some data on the internet that suggests that they're healthful benefits and we can have a separate discussion about it hopefully soon, because I think that's an interesting subject to flesh out. Uh, but your own body tells you how you feel the next day. And so many people just in lay terms and conversations highlighted it to me. But the fact that you've had, you know, a 27 year career, let's call it that. And you started very humbly as a busboy, but for the last several years, you've ran a number of bars and you are consumer facing every day, all day. And the fact that you had such powerful feedback that people actually don't feel the pain the next day from that specific, that one spirit, that agave-based spirit, I think it's worth celebrating right there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, I came to become interested in agave spirits at a much younger point in my career from a very different vantage point than I am now currently still invested in that space. So I've kind of come full circle about why I believe uh, these, this whole subset of spirits and that, and that goes as far as, you know, Bacanora, Ricea, and all the other, you know, Desolados de Agave, which hopefully we'll have time to jump into later. Absolutely. So Steve, what has been your attraction to tequila? How did you come to love it and become such a, um, you know, a prominent member of tequila community because you're now a producer. You know, I, I think um, for me probably wasn't the spirit or the alcohol I consumed young because I grew up, I think we've talked about this in the past, most of my forming years were in Germany. So probably more for me before uh, the Jägermeister girls were the Jägermeister girls in the States. You know, that was more of a digestif and uh, you drank predominantly beer and schnapps in Germany. But speaking of digestifs, you know, with tequila to kind of lead back into this, my, you know, it is, that is one of the benefits that uh, definitely in Mexico, a lot of families start their day or if anybody's sick, the medicinal purposes of, and that digestif kind of lure about tequila is definitely there. Um, I won't say that's always why I drank it, but I started more um, probably kind of college age like everybody um, I think gets. But fortunately, I don't think I was bit too hard. I was lucky enough to maybe not overindulge too many times. So I stayed the course through it. And then when I got into the wine industry, just seeing, um, you know, that majority of the wine industry is pretty much I will say supported the backbone of the wine industry is mostly guys from Mexico. And, uh, they, you know, my shtick, I, I don't think they get their, their due reward or they don't get the shout out often enough. So that's kind of where for me, it became something I was sharing with my guys. It brought us closer together. Um, and I just felt the need to kind of share, you know, every time I went out a little story about them and what a great, <laughs> What a great side benefit, right? That I get to share something, raise everybody's energy levels, and it's around this wonderful agave-based spirit. So that's, for me, where my whole link came to. And the historical context is so powerful. You both have traveled to Mexico probably more times than you care to count, Adam and Steve, and 
just being in this community and observing how people relate to it, you know, what you mentioned as far as creating a deity around, um, you know, a plant that um, is really quite, takes quite a long time to nurture and grow. You know, it's not a simple thing. It's not something you just find. I understand the minimum time is six to seven years for it to come to maturity to be able to be harvested. And sometimes it's as long as 10, 12 years. So definitely a labor of love and patience. So there's a lot of human-like qualities to the process, experience, history, communal connections. And I understand that agave fields are visually stunning. Um, Of course, being in Napa Valley, Steve is no stranger to phenomenal views all around. But I understand that there's quite um, a visual feast when you're looking out at the agave field in Mexico. Isn't that right? Yeah, it's... uh... It's to say that it's unbelievably captivating to see one of these fields uh, from the firsthand experience uh, would be a dramatic understatement. And I think when you start to study not only the the structural elements of these plants, but also just the rich biodiversity and how resilient these plants are, I mean, you'll go to certain areas in Mexico that are outside of the tequila production region that are a little bit further north. and you look at the terrain and it almost looks like snapshots of the surface of Mars. And you kind of ask yourself like, how can any organism manage to live in such incredibly harsh environments, yet you know, rep- various species of reptiles find a way to survive, agaves have find a way to survive, and, you know, and in humans even in some scenarios have found a way to make good with everything that they have in those environments. So just the sheer uh, versatility and resilience of these plants is something to marvel at. Uh, I once sat in on a conference with uh, Dr. Ivan Saldana, I believe that's his name, uh, who is one of the people that helped put Montalobos together. And he has, uh, multiple, he has multiple degrees in just, you know, how the genetic kind of makeup of plants works with agaves specifically. And I sat in one of his lectures and he said that agaves have adapted to their environment via evolutionary pressure so well that if an agave perceives that it's in the presence of rainfall or water, it can grow and mobilize rootstocks within 30 to 45 minutes. It can put down roots to absorb water when necessary in a 45 minute, 30 to 45 minute time span. Wow. Talk about adaptability. What a phenomenal plant. And if, uh, you know, for those of you guys out there that have read that, you know, agave syrup is better, you know, than other types of sweeteners because it has a lower glycemic index. um, That theory is predicated on the idea that the molecular structure of those types of sugars are much smaller. And that way, therefore, your body can therefore potentially process them easier and faster. Well, if you have genetically smaller molecular structures for these types of sugars, you can mobilize them easier. So the reason why agaves theoretically have a different type of sugar than, you know, uh, traditional sucrose that we find in most plants, it's because they needed to be able to mobilize those sugars quickly in order to survive. It's purely a byproduct of, of survival. You know, here we're in the middle of survival as a nation and as the world. So it's an interesting parallel that leaps to mind. Clearly, there's a powerful example of this plan that we love so much, all three of us. But I think there's a story that it's telling us. Those that adapt survive. Um, I think the uh, I think that there's an uh, a commonly held belief right now that I don't necessarily agree with. That you know maybe says that you know hey once this is all over. Uh, everything's going to go back to normal. And I don't know if that's true. I I think that, you know, at least until we find a way to be able to rapidly test people or, you know, have treatments predicated on antibodies or a a vaccine or whatever it is, um, I think that there's going to be a new normal that a lot of us aren't used to. Um, And I think that those of us who are able to augment, adapt, and change are going to be much better than those of us who are kind of backed into a dogmatic corner where like, hey, this is what I know, this is what I do, and I'm just gonna keep doing what I do. 
you know, there might be a, a, a very clear breaking point where the old ways have to kind of go aside because we have this new normal. Absolutely. And you guys have both, again, traveled to Mexico multiple times and you had to have seen very powerful examples of that. By what I mean, um, you know, you've seen large production facilities, corporate stuff, I'm sure, but there's got to be this mescaleros and tequileros in deep in Mexican jungle that's been making this for generations, most likely, and are doing it in very modest conditions with nothing industrious about it. Tell us more. Um, so I have spent, I believe, roughly two and a half years of my life traveling in various parts of Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, an overwhelming majority of that time spent in Jalisco specifically, and then Mexico City and Oaxaca after that. And then I've, I've been to, I don't know, I think I've been to a, a dozen plus of the 31 Mexican states. But one of the things that we're not quick to realize in this country is my understanding is that roughly 29 of 31 states of Mexico have a rich cultural tradition of making spirits out of some type of fermented agave. Or, you know, in, in the case of like Chihuahua and some of those areas, the Soltol plant, which is, uh, which is a different family, but uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, it's the same family, but it's a different uh, genus. Oh, so, okay. So, so like, for genetic. example, like, yeah. Blue Weber is a species of agave. Espadine is a species of agave. All of those agaves share the same genus, right? So you go one level up and they're all the same genus. Sotol is one level up from that. It's the same family, but it's a different genus. And then you have the different species of Sotol. So when you factor in Sotol, I, my understanding is that 29 of 31 states have a written record of saying, yes, people in these parts of the, the country have been making these types of spirits for generations. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really interesting to see how much, dare I say, institutional knowledge gets passed down generation to generation to generation, mm -hmm. especially given the fact that these, a lot, oftentimes these people don't have the financial luxuries of scientific equipment to be able to test for what they think they believe. But I have sat in front of mescaleros that can take different bottles of mezcal, shake them up, look at the perlas or the bubbles that kind of formulate after you shake up a bottle of mezcal and tell you the alcohol percentage within, you know, 0.5% error. I have goosebumps right now, by the way. That's extraordinary. Yeah, like like take a bottle, shake it up, look at it, and be like, oh, this is 46.2% uh, alcohol. And they're they're less than a percent off every single time. Wow. Talk about when, when you spoke of rich culture and deep traditions, when you see it in front of you, when somebody is so learned and has such powerful instincts, I mean, like I said, it's totally awe-inspiring. Um, and I think from a, from, from a financial vantage point, uh, the fact that so many of these people had no choice but to do that because mm -hmm. that was the only way that they could economically be viable and provide, uh, you know, the nece necessities of life for themselves and their families. You know, every time I go down there and I see people so committed to what they do and it's a byproduct of like, hey, I need to be able to survive and live and feed myself and feed my family. Yeah. Yeah. And every, time, every time I come back to the United States, I am so incredibly grateful for everything that I have. Um, and it's just, it's are, you such familiar, a are you familiar with uh, the uh, Mezcal um, Del Maguey? Oh, yeah. Ron, Ron Cooper, right? So yeah. you, you're, you're, what you're talking about right now just totally takes me to him because, you know, here's a guy that was amazing artist and uh, I'd love to actually – see if we can get him to come on and talk with us at some point. Um, Guggenheim, yeah. famous artist um, that felt the need to go down and give some of the smaller villages exactly what you're describing that didn't really have the means to even survive and started these single village mezcals, um, all with their unique different characters. And, you know, that's another positive, great agave story of, you know, somebody that reached out and, and, and gave the means to people that didn't have so much. And, um, he would be a really cool cat to get on and talk as well with us, because I tell you what, I think there's endless stories that I've seen when I've been to Mexico and traveled to all these different villages and cities. 
it, it's so vast. It's so different. You know, the, the other extreme side of that is the mass production side. And one thing that's definitely going on down there is, you know, a lot of these larger companies do control some of the costs of the agave and take a little advantage of some of the smaller, smaller growers. So a lot of them have gone to their cousin who's maybe has a still or has sort of access to being able to make alcohol. So rather than selling at this cheap price, you know, they find a way to make their own side tequila and then sell it to the bulk market. And I'm sure you've t tasted a million of them. I know I have too. And it's just never quite as good, right? Because again, like you said, they just don't have the means. They have the desire. They have the great agave, but they just may not have the technology or access to somebody like you're talking about that can actually shake up and just visually see what they're doing and know it right on the spot. So a lot of, there's a lot of variation in Mexico, um, but that's the magic, right? Isn't it? That's, I think what makes it all so cool and why guys like us are so into it. Yeah. And I think uh, anyone who has the luxury of being able to drink mezcal in the United States uh, owes a debt of gratitude to Ron Cooper and what he's done for the category. Cause I don't know that anyone has done as much for that category, especially when you take timing into consideration. Cause I mean, this dude was deeply invested in that game when no one cared. Oh, way back, way back. He, he is the OG Jedi of, of Mezcal. And I think we all owe him a, a large debt of gratitude. Cause honestly, without his, Without his voice and his enthusiasm, I don't think that the category would be nearly as evolved as it is today. So I think uh, I think that that's incredibly uh, special. And I love the fact that he was an artist. Oh. The perspective of an artist, because had he been some business mogul that was like, oh yeah, I can sell this stuff and blah, 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 you know? Uh, I think that the, the landscape of what Mezcal is today would be dramatically different. But because he, entered the space from the perspective of an, of an artist. He was like, what, what, what is the artisanal things that we can appreciate from these single villages? How can we celebrate those things? Oh, and so tell you what, and you know, I had the pleasure years ago um, in Aspen, Colorado at Food and Wine of, he came to one of the dinners um, hearing that I honored, you know, my field workers and he showed up and I forget the name of them. I'm just blank right this second. Uh, what are the, the ceramic cups? Oh, that, copitas. Yeah, thank you. Um, so he shows up with a box of them and comes in and shares it at this wine dinner. And I tell you what, it was just like one of the highlights of my life. And uh, we became friends, you know, drank way late into the night at altitude. Of course, you know where that landed. But anyway, yeah. but you know what was cool is that we're sitting there. And he goes, hey, you know, I've never made a mezcal aging in wine barrels. And this is, I'm talking 10 or 11 years ago. Now that's sort of like a cool thing with beer and everything else. But to show you how far back and forward thinking he was, he said, Hey, you know, you think you could ship me down some barrels? So we make some wines from a vineyard in Stag's Leap District. So I, I took the wine out after one year. So they were really fresh and shipped them down to him and he used them in one of his villages. So we made the first to my knowledge, I mean, so long ago, in what he told me, the first rosé mezcal from one of the villages, which was super cool. Um, they ended up only selling it in New York, but you know that was one of the many things. You know, you, those little that little domino effect of how you just fall into the rabbit hole, and he led the charge. He tipped the first domino for me. I'm talking many years ago. Yeah, I think you I think you tipped the first domino for so many of us. So, you know, with the concept of perspective in mind, Steve, as a winemaker, what was your um what was your aim with your brand? Because I have to assume based on your experience in the wine space that you had to bring a lot of that kind of knowledge and a lot of that training and a lot of that experience into the tequila space. So I'm really curious to know what about your previous experience as a winemaker at Reynolds brought to the tequila production process because you have a very unique brand in terms of not only your story but your production methodology and i think that that's a really important story to tell so i would love to know that and hear that sure thank you well thank you for asking you know for me you know it's guys like ron and seeing him go into these little villages and again 
I'm defining small space because really, really great things. It's almost that David and Goliath thing, you know, um, details matter. And, you know, when I went down and as you described earlier, a lot of people don't have access to the technology and right there, that was very apparent to me. Um, some of the things to me that I deem super important in the outcome of our wines, um, seem to be overlooked in making tequila. And a lot of that was from the fermentation side. So, you know, we all know now, cause some of these series were, were teaching people that you really make a wine first. And then that's what you distill afterwards. So there's so many layers that go into this and every one of them is important. Maybe not equally important, but certainly has, you know, definitely an effect on the outcome. So for me, it was paying attention and starting right from the beginning. Because honestly, I went down there and I thought I would just meet somebody like me that makes wine for other people. Now I'm a little bit of a gun for hire, people coming to me. But the, only, the difference with me is I'm going to, walk you through, hey, how do you want it? Do you want to start from the ground? Do you want to just take some of the product I've made and we do a custom blend for you? But along the way, I'm going to teach you and I'm going to make sure you understand you, that you're getting what you want, no matter how how original you want it to be. So I thought I'd find somebody like me in the tequila world, but that didn't happen, you know, and, and, and I'm not sure even if I'd found that person, I would have done it anyway, because you just fall in love with it down there and you start to see that, you know, where it's grown matters, how long it's in the ground matters. What were the years that it was growing? What was the climate? What was the temperature? The rain, as you described, mattered. You know, then you looked at the simple things of, you know, they're, they're cutting the leaves off. But if you really look at the surface of an agave and you look at surface area down in the nooks and crannies, there's a lot of green, a lot of leaf that's left on. Does that matter? Well, you know, in winemaking, it certainly does. We have optical sorters that will remove all that debris. And I've noticed the change in the wines. Um, so we dug deeper there and removing more of the skin. Um, you know, the heart of the agave is higher in fiber. So those details, I'm not going to go into everything, but all the way from how we cooked it to how we ground it to how much fiber was released to the water we blended in after we cooked it was more purified. So everything from even the water to the yeast, um, the wood, um, when, you know, I sat there and I, I had very deep discussions with master distillers and I'm like, so what's your favorite oak? And, you know, continually they'd come up with, oh, we love American oak. So I, then I, I knew when I asked the question, hey, what forest, what, what barrel producer of, in America, you know, do you like Missouri, Minnesota, Pennsylvania oak? And they're like, no, 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 you used whiskey bourbon barrels. And I'm like, so, ha but have you ever tasted the difference in these forests? And they're like, no. And they've never had the means. Yeah, they that. never had the means. Exactly right. It wasn't that they didn't want. And that's really what I finally started to, as you peel it back a little bit, you realize that they wanted to do this stuff. And it, they just really, it just never even occurred to them because it just wasn't there. And Finally found a place and, and some people that were just super excited by, of course, tequila and beer drinking evenings. And we dove into this. And I have some great buddies that dove into this with me. So I'm blessed that I've got four partners. So, again, our brand's Penta. Um, you know, so it's the idea of taking five regions and using these fine details. So it's five guys, five regions, five hangovers, whatever you want to call it. Okay. But, you know, that's really, that's really it. It was, I think, the details of winemaking. Um, messing a lot of things up because, and you realize when you look back on some of the wines that I made, it was the simplest thing that you thought you could overlook that totally ruined it. So to me, if you're going to start over and make something from scratch, I was never going to do that again. So when I heard the original story about your brand, um, and I spent a little bit of time in the wine space before I fully committed my life to spirits. <clears throat> I passed my level one sommelier exam. I was getting ready to take my level two sommelier exam. And then I said to my, you know, I, I kind of looked back and I said, look, if I get my level two, I'm absolutely going to try to get three. And if I get three, I'm absolutely going to shoot for four. Yeah. So I want to commit 100% of myself to this because there's, if you want to get to, even to get to three, there's no way to become an advanced sommelier without fully committing every single element of your perspective to that. And the answer for me was no, I'm not willing to make this commitment. 
And if I if I were to go down the road of getting two, I'm I'm now at this weird cross section where I have to commit my life fully to this. And I wasn't willing to make that commitment. But you know, I do have a, a small cursory kind of like uh, knowledge of grapes and wine uh, in general. And when I first heard the story about Pinta and the the idea of you guys sourcing agaves from five regions. My brain immediately went to the Bordeaux tradition of using five different grapes where every grape would have a strength. And then obviously in the, in the process of having a strength, you're going to have some inherent weaknesses. And then you pull these five different grapes together to compensate for each other's weaknesses and illuminate each other's strengths. Was that part of your mental process for doing Penta? Because like immediately that's where my brain went. It's 100%, you know, the French five noble grapes, right? And usually like anything, there's a backbone on anything and you go with the strength and then, you know, you use the strength of the smaller things um, to add accents, right? So, you know, it, it's, I guess, you know, even a great cut of meat, you know, fantastic, but sometimes a little pinch of salt a little hint of pepper brings out the, the good, you know, that, that term, you know, sometimes the sum of the parts, you know, is better than any one individual thing. So yeah, it was definitely that, that, that thought process of, uh, you know, going around each region and tasting and enjoying each of them, but definitely there was a sweet character, um, more of a U.S. palate driven style of tequila that came predominantly from Jalisco my favorite being the highlands, not that I'm not enjoying the lowlands almost as well, but definitely when you took the characters and put them together, um, it, it just made magic. Yeah. Um, and if I could jump in there real fast. So as someone who worked for, uh, at the time was a very small brand, uh, Fortaleza, which has now grown into a much, much larger brand. So I, I was, I had Here, the Lusa, we love you. Good guy. Yeah. So I had the, uh, the privilege and the luxury of getting to work for that brand for seven years. And one thing that Guillermo would always tell me is like, hey, we don't say lowlands ever because there is a psychological proclivity to think that high is better than low when they're just different. So right. we always like to say that there's highlands and then there's heartland or there's valley. And that way I think we potentially avert making people psychologically believe that one region is better than the other, because at the end of the day, to your point, they're just different. Exactly. And you know, at the lowest point in the town of Tequila, you're still well over 3000 feet above sea level. So there are high lens of, of Jalisco and there are higher lens. <laughs> but I think the primary thing that drives those difference, and you'll know this as a winemaker is just soil composition. And you go and you look at the fields of Arandas or in Toltenico or in some of those areas and you see that, vibrant red clay based soil and then you walk around areas of you know uh matitan or the town of tequila or some of the area other areas of the valley and you see this very you know sandy more mineral driven rock driven soil and immediately if you have you know any understanding about how grapes are grown you're like wow that soil is going to make a huge difference on how these plants taste so what specifically about the highland uh flavor profile kind of drew you to that you know even we talked about this um when one of the last series uh, we were with uh julio and he uh, from tommy's and we were talking even visually even visually if you were to just to not take the soil away and you just looked at the plants there's visually a much different like color tone um and uh you know, to me, um, there is a, a hint more of a sweeter character. I would say um, the lower lands or the valley-ish tends to be more, a little more floral driven to me. Um, I don't get quite that hint of, um, of that sweet fruit character that I get more up near Arandas and around there with the higher red clay soil driven um, characteristics. I think as I get down um, a bit down more towards Tequila Town, it's uh, it tends to just have more of that. Uh, um, I love the aromas, uh, unbelievably so. I think you get a beautiful balance down around Tequila of more of uh, various flowers, 
um, some botanicals and um, maybe just a hint more of some spice and um, a little more of the earth tones tend to come through. It, it, what do you find? I'd love to hear your, your comments. Uh, I, I'm almost exactly in the same boat with you on that one. And I think, you know, you have very well draining soil because there's so much obsidian and other types of, you know, stones and everything else in the soil of the heartland of the Appalachian, specifically in Tequila and Amatitan and some of the surrounding towns. So those rootstocks of the agave plants can get much, much deeper down into the soil. And I can only assume that that's where some of those, you know, those more peppery or those more vegetal or those more mineral flavors come from. Whereas the soil composition in the highlands, it does such a better job of retaining water because it's clay and clay holds onto water. So the plants have access to more water throughout the growing season. And therefore the, the bricks levels of sugars can usually get higher. And as a general rule, and obviously there's always outliers, but if we were gonna talk in, you know, in blanket statements, if you will, you get a lot more of that, um, dare I say, tropical fruit. You know, sometimes you'll get some of those like, almost like pineapple flavors out of the rich sweetness of the agaves that come from those regions. And at the end of the day, one, one is not better than the other. It's just like, who, who are you making a distillate for? Who's your audience? Exactly what, right. what, what do you want to, what do you want to like, what do you want to achieve? And then, you know, to your point about all of those different variables, it's almost like starting at the top of a family tree. And every time you make a decision, you're either walking to the left a little bit or you're walking to the right a little bit. And then you have another decision to make. And then you have to go. So you start to branch out with this multiplicative map of flavor profiles that can become manifested because of the decisions that you're making. And at every point, okay, like what kind of yeast are we using? What kind of water are we using? How big are our stills? Where do we get our plants from? And you just start to see this family tree of options expand and blow out in front of you. And it was, uh, it was the first time that I ever did a distillery tour with Sergio Mendoza of the brand Don Fulano. Um, his uncle is Enrique Fonseca, um, who is the largest agave grower in all of Jalisco. Um, for me, en Enrique is my, he's my ace of aces. You know, I, I, you know, someone that has a family lineage that spent that much time growing agaves and then to later uh, and then to later uh, become a, a, a producer himself. I mean, you, you talk about a guy who has a comprehensive understanding and a comprehensive vision of the space. And I, and I, I feel like, you know, all of us have a unique perspective and everything else. But when I'm ever in doubt of anything, I look to Enrique's voice to kind of be my guiding light because I feel like his perspective as a grower is so important. And I think you touched on something a little bit earlier too that is oftentimes ignored in, in, in this category space. So much magic happens at fermentation. So much of the magic happens at fermentation. And I think the more that we learn collectively and we study this category, we're gonna find out that, wow, we were maybe overlooking how much influence happens at this level. You know, because for the longest time, you know, as, as an employee of Fortaleza, I always knew that there was something very special and very different about that tequila. And, you know, Guillermo's, uh, Guillermo's vantage point is <clears throat> production, 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 process, 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 process. Because his family aren't agaveros. You know, they, they didn't, he doesn't come from a farming background. You know, his, his great, great grandfather was one of, you know, three families that really built the town of tequila. And because he is honoring the traditions of the old ways of making tequila before we had roller mills or screw mills or autoclaves and all of that, his bias is going to be, it's, it's production. It's, it's, it's production, it's production, it's production, which I don't, I don't disagree that that is important. But as I tasted other brands of tequila that were 100% Tahona, just like Fortaleza's, you know, he doesn't use any roller mills or screw mills in his production process. I was like, wait, these don't taste exactly like Fortaleza tastes. What's going on? And then I come to find out, you know, spending more time working with the company that Guillermo uses a proprietary type of yeast. He doesn't do natural fermentation. And then I go to some of these other facilities that are 100% Tahona and they're either maybe using, you know, natural yeast or they're using their own proprietary style of yeast. And I was like, oh, I had an epiphany. I had like a light bulb moment because I was like, here you have two brands that have very, very similar production styles 
but they don't taste anything alike. You know, Suerte does not taste anything like Fortaleza tastes. And I, and I find them both to be beautiful and lovely tequilas, but they are very different. So if it were just the Tahona that would be the deciding mechanism as to why tequila A is different than tequila B, there would be no way to account for the fact that those two brands have a very similar production methodology, but one tastes incredibly different than the other. So I think, you know, paying attention to all of those variables um, and, and as we learn more and knowing which ones are potentially more important than the other ones, uh, it's going to be a fun, it's going to be a fun road to walk together as we collectively learn more about this. You guys, I had a hard time wiping a smile off my face the entire time, this back and forth between you. First of all, if we were to take out the word distillate or the word tequila out of this discussion, we could just as easily insert wine and you would not have to change a thing. So for those of you wine nerds, I'm a card carrying one. This was such a fun conversation and I feel a definite need to have another episode when we get into the depth of production and yeast and all the good stuff that you guys have described. And Steve, you would be such an asset in that sense. Um, I just find it endlessly fascinating that you're such a success in the wine industry and really one of the mentors. And like you said, you have clients that consult with you. You have the depth and breadth of knowledge and you decided to apply yourself in a space that's pretty labor intensive. It's expensive. It's challenging logistically and otherwise, and you went after it and you made a product that's exciting and that's multifaceted. Um, I now want to get to my favorite part, consumption. I think we earned it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk you know, talk tequila as in beverage, as in aperitif, as in digestif. Do you sip it neat? Do you put great tequila into a cocktail? You know, of course, margarita leaps to mind because we all know that one. But um, both from the sipping perspective and the bartending perspective, talk to me. How should we drink it? Um, so as a bartender, um, in my younger years of my uh, professional career, I had a lot of very dogmatic driven uh, positions that said, oh, you have to do this, or it's, you know, it has to be this, or it has to be that, or it has to be the other. And uh, as I've grown and I've, you know, had more experience in the industry, I've kind of acknowledged the fact that there are infinitely more shades of gray than there are just pure black or pure white. So I'm of the belief that if you, the consumer, has money to do what you want to do, who am I to tell you to not mix whatever tequila you want to mix into a drink. It's your money. It's your experience. Um, if you want to drink, you know, uh, uh, Trace Quattro Cinco, which is, you know, a product of the, uh, the same facility that makes Don Falano that mixes three, four and five year old extra Añejo tequilas together, thus three, four, five. And it's also 43.5% alcohol, which is kind of like a fun play on numbers. Uh, and it's not cheap. It's a very expensive bottle to, of tequila. But if you want to mix that with Coca-Cola and it's your money and it's your experience, like who the hell am I to tell you that you're not allowed to do that? So as far as I'm concerned, if you like what you're drinking, you should have the light, you should have the right to like whatever it is you want to drink and drink whatever you want to drink. And while it might not be a, a decision that I would make as a consumer, I don't have your palate. I don't have your perspective. I don't have your experiences. It would be uh, a bit of a overly moral authoritarian position of me to have to tell you what you are and are not allowed to like. So I parted ways with the whole like um, morally pure vantage point of how you're supposed to consume things. I, I parted way with that perspective a long time ago. Uh, as a bar bartender. <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, like bartenders are, uh, we're, we're kind of like DJs in the sense of like, it's our job to play to the room and make the room happy. And if you can play to the room and make the room happy, and then obviously, you know, you want to abide by your, your, your moral, like, Hey, you know, I support brands that I think are ethical and yada, yada and all that stuff. But if you can operate within your first principles about what you think is moral and then play to the room and make the room happy, that's your job. So, you know, I like to think that, you know, making cocktails is a very, very, very small percentage of what we do. Because at the end of the day, it's our job to make people happy. Hey, Adam, I got a great one for you. You're sort of like a life coach, but you're a part of their life coach. 
Correct. Yes. Yeah. 100%. 100%. So I like to think from the vantage point of a bartender, right? I think that in terms of cocktails, gin is, gin's at the top. Like no spirit has the versatility uh, and is as malleable as gin is. So purely in the context of cocktails, I think that gin is the greatest spirit. I don't think it has an equal. With that in mind though, I don't think, if I were gonna compare spirits to basketball, right? You have the concept of like your sixth man, like who comes off the bench and can accurately and successfully hold the place of someone else while they're getting rest. If we were to think about like the greatest sixth person uh, of spirits, I don't think that any spirit can replace another spirit as universally as tequila and mezcal can. So if I think of any of my favorite classic cocktails, and unfortunately, you know, if you look at the old, old cocktail books, an overwhelming ma majority of recipes are built around four spirits because they only had four spirits uh, available. Brandy, whiskey, gin, and rum. Like you don't see tequila in classic cocktails ever. And it's not because tequila isn't amazing. It's just when those books and those recipes uh, were being drafted, there was no access to tequila. But I have found personally that as a bartender, if I look at a classic cocktail template and I want to pull a spirit out and put another spirit in, uh, nothing is does a good uh, as good of job of replacement than than tequila and mezcal specifically. You make a wow. tequila Manhattan, oh, especially great. if you pick especially if you pick the right reposado or the right añejo. Nothing translates that experience as well as tequila. I mean, obviously the the whiskey variations are very important. But you, you can put tequila into that template and it's nothing replaces quite as well. And that goes, I, from my vantage point, that goes across the board. Old fashions, aviations, you know, a mezcal last word is magical. Um, you, you can go on and on. And I feel like nothing does as good of job of, of being that sixth player that comes off the bench to replace something. Nothing uh, does the job as well as agave spirits. Wow, this is great stuff. Love it. Steve, I know you have a long-standing tradition of uh, raising a glass with tequila in it at your wine dinners, don't you? You know, that's a great idea, actually, because I think I've got product right here. Adam, you might have something next to you, don't you? Atta boy. Hold on, my friend. Yes, prepared. Um, I just want to say that we as a nation are drinking a lot. If you look at all the statistics, the consumption has jumped dramatically. I happen to also know that there's a great shortage of tequila because the agave plant is not something that grows very fast, as we described. And there's a huge demand for it, both from large producers and boutique ones. As, as Steve correctly pointed out, large producers absorb great quantity of it. So there's a rarity to this spirit that we have in our glasses here. Um, there's a storied history. There's so much cool stuff, the mentorship, the communal aspect. There's people like Steve that couldn't resist at all. And we're all better off for it because now we get to put something in the glass. That's his vision, which as you heard is very refined when it comes to tequila production. So you guys, I have a newfound appreciation for this fabulous spirit. I've always loved it, but the more I learn, the more I want it. And the more I want to learn, and I encourage all of you to find your favorite brand. And if you're going to drink, please drink well. Yeah, life, life is too short to not enjoy what's in your glass. I agree. And I'd like to raise a glass. And I'd like to, first of all, Adam, thanks, bro, for your time, your knowledge. Are you kidding me? Um, I look forward to when this whole COVID thing gets lifted so we can actually do this together in person. Um, but this has just been crazy fun. I wish these things could go on forever. And, you know, Ilona, of course, you do such a great job of bringing this together. We appreciate you. Um, Ed, Paul, everybody behind the scenes that are putting this together, we appreciate you very much. So cheers, everybody. Here's to you guys. Cheers. Salute. I know I will never drink the same. The next sip of tequila I take will come with a hefty dosage of, free, of appreciation for everyone that we've discussed and for you guys as well. I mean, this is such 
a, a dramatic time. And to have you, Steve, bring joy to people through what you make, through the products that you create, and to you, Adam, to still stay in business and keep people employed and, um, you know, really enrich all of our lives in different ways with your knowledge, your wisdom, your goodwill. Thank you for that. Cheers, Thanks. guys. Well, Steve, I dare say we'll be doing this again soon. Uh, Lona, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for having us. And uh, to all of the people at home that eventually watch this segment, we wish you guys nothing but the best in these, in these really tough times. So salute. Cheers. Stay healthy. Cheers.